we build up to Easter, uh, we've been talking about uh, six hours, one Friday. That you know, the, the message of the cross took place on a Friday, and it was nine o'clock till three o'clock. Six hours that forever uh, changed everything. And so, uh, uh, last week we we looked at the fact that because if we anchor our lives to the cross, we find that our lives are not futile, that there is meaning, that there is purpose, that there is life as we anchor ourselves to the cross. Today we want to look at something different. I want to talk a little bit about failure. Now all of us have at one point or another uh, experienced some kind of failure. Well, at least I'm assuming so. I don't think there's anybody. <laughs> Can I tell your story? That's, it's, so, it's so funny. I'm finishing, up, I'm finishing up my message yesterday morning at home, and I get this text from Catalina. Is church canceled today? <laughs> and uh, and I, I said, no, it's, it's Saturday. Uh, there's nobody there right now. And so I said, it's really ironic. My message is on failure uh, tomorrow. I just thought that was funny. Um, you know, uh, failure is a big part of everyone's experience. Now, uh, I, I put up a couple of videos because I'm, I'm a Toronto Maple Leafs fan, and, and the Toronto uh, uh, Maple Leafs have given me lots of reasons to talk about failure over the years. Ooh. Anyway, so I, this was a few years ago. Uh, this was a, a very famous moment in Toronto Maple Leafs history. Uh, the guy who played net, his name was Vesa Toskala, and uh, here's a, a play. This is on 19, or 2008. Yes, it is. Oh, 179 feet. That could be any year. The yeah, shut up. <laughs> okay, they're going to show this again here. Yeah. I don't think so. <laughs> Just for good measure, they throw, show it from a different angle. Okay, now, this one I have to show. This was just this week. Uh, John Tavares, 46 goals for the Toronto Maple Leafs this year. Having an amazing season. Toronto is in a shootout. He's got the game on his stick. If he scores, they win the game. Okay, here he goes. This is a guy who is an all-star player in the NHL. Yes. <laughs> Soon it, <laughs> that's his coach. That's his coach. <laughs> Soon as you lose your forward motion, that's it. Oh, so there you go. Eleven million dollars per season, and uh, yes, he. Uh, is failure now for all of us to watch. Failure happens on so many different levels. Um, you know, sometimes it happens in relational things. Uh, I don't think I, I, there are many people, if anybody, that enters into a marriage relationship with the intent that they're going to have it fall apart and fail. You know, most people, uh, I would say almost all people, when they make their wedding vows, are, are serious about them that they are, when they speak them, they are very serious about them. You know, uh, sometimes when it comes to your own kids, uh, you know, you have this intent that you're going to raise uh, your kids and that they're going to turn out a certain way and it's all going to be good. And many times we're reminded of the fact that, uh, that it doesn't always go as well as we thought it was. Sometimes it's academic. 
you know, that you thought you were going to do a certain career, um, <laughs> and then you find out that you're not cut out for that. It's funny, because I remember when I was a kid, my, one of my things that I wanted, I guess maybe anybody who was raised uh, as a kid in the 70s, we all wanted to be astronauts. And, uh, and I discovered very, very quickly, uh, I went on a merry-go-round at one of those parks, you know, one of those death things that they did? You, you, you used to have them when we were kids, that they were in a park and they were a metal, this metal thing of death that we would swing around on. I went on there, I felt so, so sick, and I realized I am never going to be an astronaut. <sighs> you were supposed to grieve more with me with that one. Um, loss of job or career path. Uh, loss of job can be such a devastating failure in your life. I've known some people that it was catastrophic. Uh, and, and actually some of the other things happened because of it. Their, that their loss of job ended up causing marriage problems and caused all sorts of different things. Loss of job or career path, I'm not going to say this, I don't want to make this an overgeneral statement, but sometimes men get their identity from their job. And with the crashing of their identity, um, it can be devastating to them. Um, sometimes it can be a moral failure, you know, that there's something that happens uh, that, that causes uh, some issues in your life. You know, many, many people who get into my position, because moral failure is also career ending in, in some of us, uh, uh, our positions. Um, sometimes it can be a spiritual failure. Um, and sometimes it will be a financial failure. You know, you think that you're going to be uh, working towards some kind of financial picture, and, uh, and, and then you realize that um, uh, we, Jen and I renewed our mortgage, and uh, oh man, one of those things that you, I, I, it was, every once in a while you have a thing that reminds you you are really, really getting old. And I went to renew our mortgage, and we were looking at different options of what we were going to do. And if we completely renewed our mortgage with a brand new mortgage, my insurance, because I was old, was going to jump $200 per payment. We were doing two payments per month. That's $400 extra a month because of, and all of a sudden it was like, oh. Anyway, so I, at that precise moment, I, even though it was a fine, felt like a financial failure, but really my failure was I was getting old. Jeepers. Let's just talk a little bit. I, I thought I would just open this up. I've got a number of an answers on the board. <laughs> I feel like a game show host. I've got a number of answers on the board. 100 people surveyed. Top five answers on the board. What's the impact that failure has on people? You know, if failure happens, what's the impact that happens on people's lives when they experience failure? Just give me some ideas. Let's just throw a few out. Depression. Depression, Depression is a big part of it that you end up uh, you know, just feeling overwhelmed uh, and, and completely depressed about it. Uh, that could be the, the financial impact, you know, that there could be, that could be one of the side effects that happens to uh, somebody is, is that you end up bankrupt and then you end up being financially limited over an extended period of time. Uh, what are some other ideas? Depression, bankruptcy? Sorry. Sickness. Actually, yeah, it can physically make you sick. Uh, if you experience failure, oftentimes... Um, uh, stress comes along with that, and then you end up feeling sick. Low self-esteem. Self yeah, you just feel like uh, there's a lot of, of bad in your life, and you just start to, and that leads with depression as well. Brenda, addiction. Actually, addiction can be because you're doing something to make yourself feel better, and so you end up uh, buying too much, drinking too much, too much, just too much. Judgment. Explain that one to me. What do you think? What are you thinking about? Oh yeah. So so uh, other people, when you fail, that they're judging you. Yeah, you need a new set of friends then. Divorce. Divorce. Uh, that can be a big part of it as well. Is is that that's another impact that can happen if you have marital failure. Divorce is the ultimate outcome of it. Suicide. Suicide, Suicide can be a big part of it as well. That people uh, again, you know, that when they have that. Uh, something, a big failure in their life, it ends up leading towards uh, uh, suicide. And loneliness? loneliness. You can feel very lonely. Sorry. Suicide. And, homicide. and homicide. Yeah, boy, yeah. You, you've, yeah, that's awful when that happens. You know, when uh, 
somebody decides that, well, if, if I can't be with my family, nobody's going to be with my family or something to that extent. Very horrible. Guilt and shame that goes along with feeling failure. Um, here's just some of the ideas. I, regret was one that I had. Depression. Uh, paralyzed and fearful. Sometimes if you fail, you get paralyzed and you don't feel like you can do anything then. It just paralyzes you. Uh, and, and sometimes that can transfer to others. In, if you are a parent and you experience failure, sometimes you can put that on your own kids. Don't even try something, you know, because if you're just going to fail. And so that, that ends up kind of going along with that. Um, it distorts your perspective. You know, you get kind of messed up. You look at everything from a negative perspective. Um, it creates in with you a, a fear of failure. Um, suicidal. And, um, and so there's all sorts of different things. And you guys added a lot more to that as well. So there, there's a lot of impact that happens when failure happens in our lives. Now, the one really, really good thing um, about Scripture is, is that Scripture is full of people who messed up royally. I love the fact that that's there. Because if Scripture was all, all success stories, I would feel really, really bad. And so here we have in Scripture all sorts of people whose lives are total tanks. They've tanked their lives. They've done all sorts of things that are wrong. And yet, through that, God does incredibly amazing things. Let's take a look at, at I just want to look, uh, we're going to actually do kind of something a little bit different. We're just going to skim over a lot of stuff today. Um, but I'm going to give you the references of where these are, so if you want to take a closer look at them later. The woman caught in adultery. This is a story where uh, the Pharisees bring a woman caught in adultery to Jesus. Now, really, the woman is incidental in this issue in some regards. They were trying to get Jesus. Uh, they, were, they were trying to figure out ways of going after Jesus. And so they, this is one of the ways that they decided that they were going to do this, is they found a woman who was caught in adultery. Now, there's always a... I, I think this is the funny part of the story is, is that they bring the woman who's involved in adultery. Last time I checked, you can't do adultery by yourself. <laughs> I think we're all good on that. But they only bring the woman involved because women were lower in society. Uh, so they, this was, it was all kind of a setup that they had. And so they're trying to trap Jesus. But... In this instance, her shame and her moral failure is revealed to the world. How many of us would like, if we were involved in some kind of moral failure, to be dragged out into public and have everybody know and, and everything that we've done wrong revealed in front of other people? And so here you have this lady who is thrown into this situation where she is, uh, her moral failure is relieved to the, re revealed to the world. But in that situation, Jesus has compassion. They were looking for, these guys bring her, but they don't just bring her. They bring um, stones to the party. That their, their intent is, is, and they are ready to kill this lady, to make a point. And so here they are revealing her sin. The Old Testament says that those that are caught in adultery, they should be stoned. And so here these guys have come, they've got stones, they're ready. But in the midst of this, Jesus has compassion on this lady. And, and, he, and he does, uh, he says to the crowd, you know, let him who has no sin throw the first stone. And they realize that Jesus has caught them instead of them catching Jesus. And so in this situation, Jesus reaches out to this person who is in the caught in the middle of moral failure, and he has compassion on her. So Jesus literally saves her life. There was a very high possibility, depending on how things were going, that this woman was going to die, that they were going to kill her. And Jesus literally saves her life. But also, Jesus gives her a wonderful opportunity for a new start. And he says to her at the end of the conversation, he has compassion on her and, and reaches out to her and he says, go, to, go and sin no more. Leave this. You have got the opportunity to be able to have a fresh start. And so here, Jesus, someone who has been caught in moral failure, what does he do? 
He takes the opportunity to show compassion and bring her the opportunity for a fresh start. Amen. And then we've got Peter. Uh, Peter is, is follows Jesus. He's one of Jesus' closest companions. You know, it was Peter, James, and John. They were the inner circle. They were the ones that were closest to Jesus. And so here we have Peter. Uh, he's one of Jesus' closest followers. He's been following from almost the beginning. And this is when it all started to break loose. Jesus is arrested. Um, you know, and we know that Peter was a pretty bold guy. Peter did bold things. Uh, you know, he was even to the point where he, he, would, he would correct Jesus. You know, you've got to have a pretty tight relationship with your leader. If you're able to... You know, now, Jesus also called him Satan at that precise moment, which was not kind of very kind, but it was true. Uh, and, and, so, and, and just before this has happened, Peter is, is, is sword-flinging Peter. You know, they're in the garden, and, and he's chopping a guy's ear off, and, you know, he's bold, and he's wild, and he is out there. Uh, but in the midst of this, if, as things begin to un, unravel in front of Peter, Jesus is arrested, uh, they, he gets into the, to where... Uh, he can get close enough to see Jesus. And, uh, and in the middle of that, Peter denies. And, and Jesus had told him he was going to do this. And yet in it, Peter denies Jesus three times. And so what we have here is a complete ministry failure. You know, Peter had given his life to serve Jesus. And when things got really, really tough, he, he crashed. You know, he denied Christ three times, and he denied Christ to people who, uh, uh, to to people who are of really insignificant. Like one was a servant girl, um, you know. And he's trying to hide the fact. You know, now Peter Peter came from a place uh, where they had a very distinct accent, and uh, you know, and it would be almost like. Uh, you know, me coming up to Graham afterwards and going, you're British, aren't you? And you go, oh no, jolly no, I'm not. You know, it's like, well, you know, the jig is up here. There's, you can't, you're not hiding that. You can give it a whirl, but you know, and so Peter is, you know, you're from there, aren't you? And you're following Jesus. No, no. And, you know, it's almost like, no, buddy, I'm not, you know, whatever the, I don't know what the Galilean accent would have been. I would have think it had a bit of Newfie in it. I'm not sure. Anyway, but here in the midst of this, Peter has first person, complete moral failure. Peter, complete, complete ministry failure. Burns out, you know, or cra- actually he doesn't burn out, he crashes out. But yet in the midst of this, Jesus comes after his resurrection and he goes out of his way. You know, and, and it was such a severe kind of um, break that when Jesus, he wants to see Peter, he says, bring the disciples and Peter. He wants Peter to make sure that the break was so significant that Jesus doesn't include him in the disciples at that precise moment. That was how, how severe the break was. And, and yet here Jesus says, I want to see him. And at that point, you know, he, he reaches out and says, Simon, do you, do you love me? And three times he asks them that question, but then they come to the, to, you know, kind of to match the three failures. He asks them three times. You know, and here we have Peter, who ministry crashes, and yet Jesus uses him, and he becomes instrumental in the early church. And then we have the thief on the cross. Luke chapter 23. You know, and the thief on the cross really does deserve his punishment. He deserves what he's getting. He was uh, involved in wrong things. You, you don't get sentenced to death because you were a Boy Scout. You know, he is at the cross because he was worthy of his punishment. And so here he is, he's hanging on the cross. And so his is more of a complete life failure. He chose uh, to do the wrong things. He chose to hang out with the wrong people. He chose all these wrong things. His was a complete life failure. But yet, on the cross, 
Jesus forgives him for all that he has done. You know, all these awful things that he did, Jesus, he didn't say, you know, oh, I'll forgive you for this, for this, this, and this, and, but that, oof, boy, that was pretty awful. He doesn't do that. He forgives them totally and completely. And Jesus guarantees him on the cross. He guarantees him eternal life. Here we've got a guy that he never got a chance to redeem himself. He never got a chance to serve Jesus. He never got a chance to do any of that because he was dying. But yet on his deathbed, Jesus forgives him for all that he has done. And he says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. Today. And this gives us great hope as the church. Because there is, it is never, ever too late. And you are never too far gone. This guy was at a point where you almost think it's too late. You know, he's dying, you know, and, and he doesn't get a chance to redeem himself. And yet, Jesus forgives him and guarantees him eternal life because it is never too late. You are never too far gone. You know, as you look at the cross, in many regards, it even looks like failure itself. It's the brutal end to Jesus' life. Jesus has been ministering on, on in for about three years, and his life comes to a brutal and abrupt end. And it does seem like, seemingly seems like the end of his ministry. That was what the intent was. The intent was, we're going to kill him. This is going to put a final squash on this forever. How wrong could they be? Because the message of the cross is one that now transcends time and reaches to us 2,000 years ago. It scattered his disciples. All his disciples went different ways. But 1 Corinthians 1.28 says this, God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things. And the cross was a despised thing. And he says, and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. God took what seemingly from the outside looks like failure and transform it into the greatest success of all history. An amazing transformation that God takes what looks like something and transforms it because out of the cross comes our hope and out of the cross comes our salvation. And we are saved in eternity because of the cross. Your failure is not fatal. All of us have experienced failure in some way or another, but your failures are not fatal fatal and this morning i would encourage you you know if you've got something that is just weighing you down you know some ministry failure some moral failure maybe it's a more complete life failure whatever it is today's the day to give it at the foot of the cross and say god i hate this i don't want to carry it anymore i'm giving you my failure because we all stumble in many ways. Scripture, James tells us that. It says we all stumble. We all make mistakes. We all do things wrong. We all have regrets that we hang on to. But the message of the cross says that we don't need to hang on to those things. just want to show you quickly a video here. Uh-oh. That was quick. Your sin was black and Jesus took it away. Is there a way of getting it to start there, Lynn? I tried it. Yeah, I know, but just, just uh, is there a way of pressing play on it on back there? Are you sure? I, I tried it beforehand and it worked. No? 
It was so good, too. Okay, hold on. Let's see if it, just wait, it starts black. It was really good, too. It's a cliffhanger. We'll have to show it next week. That's so funny. Um, I, it was on my computer, so it may, not have, it may not have fully transferred. But I did try it, and it worked beforehand. I always experiment these things to make sure that it's all good, but it didn't work. Oh, well. It's not fatal. It's not, my failure is not fatal, people. Anyway, the point is, is, is that it went through all sorts of different people from Scripture. And it said, you know, Moses killed a man. Noah was a drunk. Um, you know, Peter denied Christ. David had a complete and utter moral failure. If you go through Scripture, there are so many different people that all bombed. And so, you know what? It gives us great comfort because we're all in very good company, right? Because those people went on to do great and powerful things for God, even in the midst of their failure. And so, um, wouldn't it be fun if it worked? Now it's not going. Well, now I'm, whoa! Ah! I was, I was hoping, ah, ah! Isn't it amazing that God uses, all, uses us even in the midst of our failure? And actually, failures do a number of things that nothing else will do in our lives. Number one, our failures make us lean on God. You know, um, one of the things that I, and with a lot of my family and life situation over the last number of years, the scripture that has been in my mind and I almost quote it on a daily basis is, these things have happened that we might not depend upon ourselves, but on God. And so in the midst of my failures and the reminder of those things, I am reminded of the fact that these things have happened that I need to depend more on God. It's not on my strength, it's on God's. And the other side of it is, is that our failures sometimes have our greatest impact. Um, because when God brings you through something, or even in the midst of going through it, these are your most powerful parts. Because you know what? I can go through life and, and make it seem like I have it all together. Now, you guys know totally different. But if I present to the world that I have it all together, you know what? 90% of the world know that you're a total fake. It's in our struggles that we really, people see that you are real. And it's through our struggles that we have our greatest testimony of the power of God in our lives. Because it's when we are weak that God is strong. And we are when we are at that weakest point that God brought us through that. And and and, and because I've had a I've had some uh, I've had some professional counselors say to me, I don't know how you did it. And I go, Well, I didn't. 
It was only because of God helping me through that I was able to get through some of this stuff. And if professional counselors are telling me that, I just think that, wow, this is a neat opportunity that God has given me. And we always need to be prepared. Your thing that you are the most embarrassed about, the thing that you think is your greatest failure, is the thing that God wants to use the most to bring him glory. Because out of your weakness, God's strength will be evident. And so we need to be, our failures become our greatest impact. Six hours, one Friday, anchor point, the second one is, is that your failures are not fatal. God wants you to bring your failures to him and lay them at the foot of the cross. And out of those things, God is going to, out of the ashes, bring new life. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that, uh, that our failures are not fatal. That we all stumble. And some of us, Father, have done some things that we regret. We feel horrible about it. But Father, you just want us to bring those things to you. And out of those things, you are going to make something beautiful. Father, thanks that we are able to anchor ourselves to the message of the cross. That even though the cross on, from the outside eye looks like failure, it is the very thing that brings us salvation and it brings us hope for eternity. And Father, thank you that out of our failure, you can make beautiful things. We ask these things in Jesus' name.